Okay, everybody see that? Yes. Very good. So uh, picky plants for picky pollinators is the topic. And uh, a little bit about my background. I, my background is training in botany, but it's primarily marine botany. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so I have a master's and bachelor's from the Ohio State University and then a PhD in botany from Duke. Uh, but I am now, of course, a visiting scholar at UNC. So uh, I'm, uh, I have a card. I'm a card carrying UNC um, visiting scholar. So <laughs> that goes well with the Duke and the Carolina fans, I hope. Um, anyway, uh, some of the plants that earlier flowered in my yard was the, uh, are these, and most of you will recognize these plants, um, particularly witch hazel uh, over here. And you can see this bee has a, a load of pollen on the back. So they primarily after pollen on this plant. Uh, and over here, they're on quince and uh, red bud is finished up here now. So we're finished with the, with the red bud flowering. This plant, sweet shrub, is currently uh, in full flower in my yard right now. Um, and this happens to be a beetle pollinated uh, flower. So uh, which has an interesting story behind it. If you want to look up uh, sweet shrub and its, its uh, peculiarity and how it handles beetles in the pollination cycle. And this is just a recent photo of quince uh, showing the stigmas and the rich source of pollen around the outside. This is not a, a native, uh, but it flowers early and uh, any pollinators that are out there certainly take advantage of, of the nectar and the pollen uh, that's there. <clears throat> so this morning, we're gonna talk a little bit about why, why uh, support bees? Uh, what are native plants and native pollinators? Uh, what are the benefits of planting native plants? How do you create and sustain pollinators uh, with native plants? And I have a number of, of links that I'll provide for uh, PDF files that discuss this. Um, who are these picky pollinators? We'll take a brief survey of some of those. Um, and uh, selected nectar and pollen plants monitored by North Carolina beekeepers will be part of the talk, ones that are the beekeepers monitor uh, here in, in the Piedmont. And then I'll have um, Jeff's pollinator picks, the ones that I have found very successful in my yard and the ones that you've a lot of have planted in um, Harbor Gate uh, Garden there at the Extension Office. So why support pollinators? Uh, we know that Animal pollinators are required for the reproduction of about 90% of flowering plants and one third of human food. And we know that these pollinators evolved along with flowers <clears throat> uh, some 300 million years ago. And that's why there's such a dependency uh, between the insects and the flowers. Pollinators are part of the web that really supports the biological diversity in the natural ecosystem and helps sustain our current quality of life and these healthy populations of pollinators, which we are losing, unfortunately, at a rapid rate, do improve fruit set, fruit quality, increase in fruit size, and increases in farming productions for crops. So um, that is, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're losing those populations. So what's all the buzz about? <clears throat> this is a recent publication by the USDA, and it indicates that um, uh, about 4,000 types of bees are currently present in the U.S. and Canada, uh, uh, and about 500 here in North Carolina, native bees. And they noted that in 2019, 157 million pounds of honey valued of about $309 million <coughs> um, was added to the economy. The total annual value of uh, U.S. honey products and services sold is about 700 million and uh, more than 100 US grown crops rely on pollinators. Uh, the added revenue to crop production from pollinators is valued at over $18 billion. And it's interesting to note that um, most of the income for commercial beekeepers is not coming from their honey. It comes from the pollination services provided by their bees that they transport all over the US at various times of the year when, when necessary 
uh, to enrich the pollination services for all those crops. Uh, migratory bee, uh, commercial beekeepers uh, truck their hives all over the US. Uh, and we know that the European honeybee is responsible for most of that. Uh, and uh, there's a, a bee that's just pollinating a peach blossom. Uh, Mark might like this. Uh, hopefully the peaches are doing well at Buster Sykes. <clears throat> Bees and other pollinators are of course essential. 87% of the flowering plants and 75% of the crop plants require some sort of pollinator so the, they can produce uh, and bear seeds or fruit. Uh, pollination services accounts for about a third of our food and a majority of the vitamins a, C, and E in our diet that come from these uh, plants that have been pollinated by pollinators. So on the left, you see breakfast, <coughs> the breakfast with bees, uh, uh, apples, you can recognize most of that. And then over here is an example of breakfast without bees. So it's sort of stark serving for breakfast uh, if we suddenly lose these pollinators. Uh, honeybees and native bees are responsible for pollinating a lot of the fruit, berry, and nut crops, particularly the almonds in California, in particular macadamia nuts, uh, kiwis, uh, melons, apples, cherries. Uh, uh, this group down here will talk a little bit about a special bee that's really specialized. And if you want that bee in your yard, you will need to plant these uh, squash and zucchini plants. So the values of, of bees here and pollinators in North Carolina, on um, left over here, we see Native bees are quite uh, responsible for blueberries and strawberry pollination. Bees do interact, but the primary uh, uh, pollinators are these native bees. Uh, honey bees, on the other hand, and particularly North Carolina, pollinate apples, peaches, alfalfa, particularly for seed production, for forage crops, cotton, uh, lint and seed, peanuts and soybeans. Uh, one special group, uh, that I mentioned earlier is the squash bee, uh, and it's very, a very picky um, uh, uh, pollinator, and will visit watermelons, cucumbers, melons, and pumpkins, so members of the cucurbits. Um, honeybees are native to North, are, are not native to North or South America, but are manageable as pollinators, so beekeepers are able to manage, in some cases, their hives, and uh, are able to have productive hives and stop the swarming that may occur. But commercial beekeepers are, are really um, uh, good at, at controlling the populations that they manage. Um, honeybees are gentleness, they're not picky. So any flowering plant with suitable nectar and or pollen uh, as an attractant or open forage for these uh, for the, for honeybees. So they're not picky. They again are from Europe, uh, as mentioned as the European honeybee. That's not the American honeybee. Uh, and on the left, you see a book by uh, Heather Holm uh, on pollinators of native plants, a really uh, well done uh, publication. And she covers bees, butterflies, moths, wasps, flies, and beetles. <clears throat> So down below is a list of uh, picky uh, uh, pollinators that require us to really consider a native source of plant nectar and pollen sources that we might consider including in our pollinator gardens. Native species are those that occur in a region in which they evolved. So these bees uh, that we find, the 500 bees that we currently uh, have been identified in North Carolina uh, have been resident here for hundreds of thousands of years. More specifically, native plants in particular area here in the Southeast are those that are growing naturally in the area before European settlement. That's kind of one of the definitions. But down below, you will see that we have uh, in the North America, we have 4,000 native bees. We have about uh, 30,000 wasps, 16,000 flies uh, that have been identified, 30,000 beetles, uh, 12,000 moth species in North America and 20,000 uh, butterfly species. So what are native plants? Well, a book published uh, by um, Derek and Doug Tallamy uh, sort of spelled it out in defining what they consider to be native. 
And it basically is a plant or animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time, uh, sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and with other organisms uh, in a given ecological community. So that is their sort of uh, definition of, of native. <clears throat> so why native plants? <clears throat> Native plants are adapted to the local conditions uh, since they have really evolved here uh, in the Southeast. Uh, they are a valuable alternative for landscaping, uh, conservation, for restoration projects and livestock forage. So they are uh, available and uh, hopefully we're gonna find more native plants being selected for planting. Native plants are wildlife's primary food source in the Southeast. Native plants are, can be as beautiful as the finest cultivated hybrids, uh, often surpassing those non-natives, exotics, uh, in ruggedness, in resistance to drought, insects, and disease. So really ideally suited for the environment in which they evolved. <clears throat> what are the benefits of native plants? They can help prevent and spread exotic species, which we constantly fight in our gardens. Uh, and... Um, they can help uh, avert future introductions of some of these exotic plants that end up here in the U.S. It can help maintain the soil uh, fertility, improve it, uh, reduce erosion in certain plantings, and often uh, require less fertilizer or pesticides than many of the non-native plants. Yeah. Um, also, native plants attract a greater variety of, of native bees, bumblebees, moths, butterflies, hummingbirds, songbirds, and of course, other wildlife uh, than traditional lawns. Uh, native species rarely become invasive. So we don't find any native plants that are on the invasive species list. So where is the food for wildlife in a lawn? It's a good question. I love a flower that, uh, a lawn that flowers. So getting the most out of your yard uh, need to change and sort of ecological design mindset that we have, include a, a majority of plants native to our local ecoregion, and I'll talk about the ecoregion in a moment, select a diversity of species in height ranges, less lawn, more trees, shrubs, vines, and flowers, and provide the, these provide year-round uh, food supply, flowers, fruits, seeds, leaves, stems. So often I do not go out and clean up after the frost hits, I let things sort of die on their own and remain standing until spring. I begin to see the early production of leaves at the base of plants, then I'll go ahead and cut them. But uh, they uh, can be used as food sources even during the winter. So what is an ecological region? Um, well, uh, we have one on the coastal area, Middle Atlantic Coastal Forests is one. Uh, we're in the southeastern mixed forest. And then, of course, we have the Appalachian or Blue Ridge forest. And you will notice that this particular area, the southeast mixed forest, extends across multiple states, Virginia, uh, center part, the Piedmont of North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, we get into um, Alabama. We get into Louisiana. We get into Georgia. So this whole area has similar climate and similar plant uh, species uh, that live in those areas. <clears throat> a lot of this uh, about native plants and uh, how to save the native, uh, the native plants or native bees has come about by uh, these publications by Doug Tallamy. Uh, first was the, uh, the uh, let me get rid of my screen here. Uh, the um, 2016 was that was published. And then in 2019, he published Nature's Best Hope. And just recently, just this year, he's published uh, A Nature of Oaks, all about oak trees. Um, but this book, Prime Bringing Nature Home, uh, has really raised the consciousness of the importance of native plants in sustaining the wildlife. <clears throat> um, a lot of you probably heard about the insect apocalypse that's here. Uh, New York Times Magazine had a big uh, issue uh, that treated this. Uh, for example, reporting that monarch butterflies fell by 90% in the last 20 years. 
and, and lost about 90 million individuals. The uh, rusty patch bumblebee has been in the news recently. Uh, once lived in 28 states, has dropped by 87% over the same period. Um, how do we know? Well, there have been studies, they've been studied, they've been monitored, and we're finding that the, the populations continue to decrease. Windshield phenomena is another one. Uh, our integrated pest management system with pesticides has, has caused the uh, loss of a lot of insect life, particularly if you're driving down the highway or a back road, we often had to stop sort of clean off the insects off our windshields. And now I barely get one hitting my windshield. So it's kind of something they're monitoring uh, and uh, have noticed a real decrease in the number of, of um, insects that are, are, are living. So the pesticide Integrated pesticide management has done a done its job. Unfortunately, the concern by many uh, is that the entire insect world might be quietly going missing. Studies going on in Germany and Europe uh, on the the uh, also the depletion of these populations. Um, the monarch butterfly is of interest. Yesterday, I received a, an email from uh, the Ohio State University. And uh, they're going to feature on April the 21st, uh, the day before Earth Day, a uh, presentation on solutions to help restore the monarch butterfly. And it will include Doug Tallamy as one of the presenters along with these other uh, um, presenters. Uh, it's registered, but it's, uh, it, it's an opportunity if you're interested in monarch butterflies, might be interesting to, to catch. Uh, the Ohio State University Bee Lab has sponsored a number of really good webinars. And I'll have that link for you in there because they are, they are posted out on their website and you can watch them. So nectar, uh, connector pollinator uh, plant uh, phenology, what, what is this? Well, uh, phenology is really the science of dealing with the influence of climate. And as we know, climate is changing uh, and the reoccurrence of such annual phenomena in plant life uh, that uh, we can watch. So first, when the first leaves appear, when the first flowers appear, when the fruit set, first leaf fall, et cetera. So all of these things are monitored uh, on the plants. And there's a whole network out there, the National Phenology Network that you can log into and see uh, what occurs over time in the US as the seasons progress and the plants uh, begin to leaf out. Um, there's a campaign now to focus on about 53 species of nectar plants, and uh, they have been identified basically as great sources for monarchs, uh, but also for other pollinators. And a number of societies are involved in working with this group. And uh, in, the, in the links below, uh, there are 53 species, and you can you all know, have this link in there. You can go out and see what those species are at their website. And you can also go out uh, on their site. And when you select plants, North Carolina, there are photographs posted of 478 uh, photos of plants uh, that are in North Carolina uh, and are part of, this, uh, part of this study. So uh, these are interesting sites if you have an interest in them. One really interesting thing that's happened since bringing up pollinators is this book that has just been issued uh, called Pollinator Gardening for the South, uh, Creating Sustainable Habitats. And this is really well done. Uh, and it's a $24 book. Uh, it'll help get you started and maintain habitats um, and support some of the pollinator pollinations uh, that, as I mentioned, are, are in steep decline. It focuses on native pollinators and native plants. Uh, and it's uh, the pollinators and humans sort of seek the same things out of their gardens. One is color, uh, hopefully diversity, and a lot of seasonality so that you have plants coming along in flower through the seasons, uh, both spring, um, summer, winter, or fall and winter. Uh, and both our associate professors at uh, horticulture at NC State uh, and one of the authors, Anne, uh, so 
has published uh, part of the rain garden. They published a rain garden book also that features uh, pollinator plants that are good for rain gardens. Uh, so it also covers the USD hardiness zones, hardiness zone six, seven, and eight. Uh, we're in seven A or seven B, uh, included in twelve southern states, and it sort of brings together the science uh, and the art of uh, creating these gardens uh, in containers, community schools, or large scale gardens. Uh, and step by step instructions are there on how to locate it, how to prep your soil. Uh, and uh, again, it's, it's very well done. And, and a lot of illustrations and photographs with, with design plans and handy charts and lists. Uh, they even have phenology charts that are included. Uh, and this one you can see is a sort of a simple one, a visual interest. So they cover perennial shrubs, trees. So these have these phenological charts available for these groups of plants. And uh, here, the simple one shows spring, summer, fall, sort of general, uh, when the eastern redbud is in flower. Uh, down here, you have the trumpet, honeysuckle, rosemary, which has foliage present in the spring, in fact, all the way through till winter. Uh, and in the summer, of course, we have uh, purple cone flower in flower. Then a little more detailed by month, uh, you can see they also have charts that give you the month by month. So you can see when a particular plant our plants are, are in full flower uh, and when their foliage is present. So again, really well-documented charts. This is one of the freebies. This is a free PDF I'll give you the link to. Uh, selecting trees and shrubs as resources for pollinators. Uh, and it's from the uh, University of Georgia Extension. Uh, it's about 64 pages. It's a, it's a pretty good docu document. Um, Georgia's pollinators are featured, and I'll show you some of their photographs coming up uh, on the pollinators there that are featured. Uh, and uh, it also has pages of information on, on the plant name, the scientific name, where it had the growth. Uh, it has um, the button bush, eastern red bud. So it gives details about which kinds of bees are attracted to those plants. And then also, again, has phenology on it. So in there, you have chart after chart of when they flower, when it's in flower, flower color, whether it's a native plant or non-native, the kind of the growth habit is that a shrub, a perennial, a small tree, uh, and the bloom time, again, all the way February through October. So um, there are all the plants that are discussed there have these charts, very helpful. <clears throat> um, in creating a, a pollinator friendly landscape, uh, a lot of you I know have had established gardens and trying to integrate uh, pollinator friendly or native plants into that landscape sometimes can be uh, challenging, um, but hopefully uh, you'll have room to replace either plants or use it. So you wanna use a, a, a wide variety of plants that bloom from early spring uh, through late fall. Uh, avoid modern hybrids with double flowers. Um, the location of the nectaries, the anthers, uh, are hidden within the double flower or petals, and it's almost impossible for pollinators to, to reach. Um, not much pollinator seeds produced usually in these hybrids, um, so you want to kind of stay away from those. Uh, mix a few in, but realize that it's difficult for the pollinators to get any nutrition uh, from them. Uh, pigments in purple leaf foliage uh, taste bad, uh, endangering some insect life cycles. So some of these hybrids have uh, a strong presence of certain pigments that uh, are not readily digestible by some of the uh, host caterpillars and so forth. If hybrid plant sizes or flower colors diverge widely from the native parent plants, uh, they're kind of unrecognizable by our native pollinators that have evolved here. Uh, bees are extremely sensitive to flower color. So they're basically attracted to blue, purple, violet, white, and yellow flowers. Uh, and you notice that red is missing primarily because most bees cannot see in the red range of, of light. So uh, anything red appears black to them. <clears throat> um, and creating this pollinator friendly landscape, you wanna eliminate pesticides whenever possible. Uh, you want to include larval host plants in your landscape. 
uh, create a, a puddling area for butterflies and bees. If you have room in your yard, uh, spare that limb. So don't pick up all your branches that some of them uh, that you cut over the winter or in spring you can leave them in a little pile, uh, particularly if they have hollow stems. Uh, a lot of our native bees uh, will set up uh, home in those in those uh, limbs and hatch their young in the in the next uh, winter or next spring. Um, you can add nectar resources by providing like hummingbird feeder. In fact, two days ago I saw a hummingbird uh, flying around in our yard, uh, so that's a good sign. Butterflies need resources other than nectar, uh, and there's a lot of interesting uh, publications out there on butterflies and what you can provide in the yard. Always have a water source. I have about three uh, bird baths scattered in my yard, uh, which are used by bees and by birds. So um, uh, just checking for mosquito larvae once a week, dumping it and making sure they're clean. Uh, and then learn more about native plants with the pollinators visit. And some of those plants, native plants, can be found in books like this, Southeast a Native Plant Primer, um, 225 plants for the Earth Friendly Garden. Uh, well, a good publication, Larry Mellencamp, Paula Gross uh, from the Arboretum in Charlotte have published this. Uh, plants honeybees use in Ohio, Tennessee valleys, covers uh, North Carolina, Virginia. Uh, well done book. Um, and uh, Shannon um, is in, um, lives in Kentucky. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a good pu publication to have on hand uh, with the bees. This one is uh, more comprehensive uh, garden plants for honeybees. So uh, again, lots of resources out there uh, that are available. Uh, another one is by the Xerces Society, Save the Bees, and it, it lists 100 plants um, that um, you might consider. Here's another freebie. Uh, this is a little publication uh, native plants for small yards. Uh, a lot of us have, have uh, downsized and maybe moved to smaller areas or a smaller home. Uh, but this little book uh, is very, very useful and um, has design templates in it that cover a corner garden, mailbox garden, uh, small water features, container gardens, downspout garden, rock wall garden, front porch garden, sidewalk, strip garden, and back patio. Again, it's a free publication and I'll put the link in. But here's an example of the little corner garden. Uh, it, it illustrated very well here. And then a plan on the side, you can see where the plantings are. Uh, and here's the sidewalk, there's a sidewalk here. So it gives the list of plants, it has another page that gives alternates. If you have trouble finding some of the plants listed here, it has a list of alternate plants that you can select uh, that take their place. So again, uh, well done and uh, easy to use uh, publication. Another site that I stumbled onto was Plant by Numbers. Uh, interesting site out of Lexington, Kentucky, the city of Lexington had published this. And they have plans for full sun easement, cool flora, or uh, they have a, you know, again, a, a sun mailbox, uh, shade easement, uh, cool warm flora, flora. Uh, leafy green. So they have these various uh, choices out there. And when you click on them on their website, uh, you come up with these two page documents that uh, here's the one for the mailbox uh, with the plant list. Here the plants are listed with links uh, where to buy the plants. Of course, this is Lexington, in Kentucky, but we can certainly source some of those plants here. Planting instructions, maintenance, uh, again, a nice little site uh, if you are not a designer and you want help in putting together uh, plants that work together with pollinators. <clears throat> so who are the pollinators? Well, we all know about honeybees and I know uh, quite a bit about honeybees, uh, but I've sort of turned attention to our native bees. Uh, one of those is the carpenter bee, which a lot of people seem to have trouble with. Um, and uh, it's a great pollinator, uh, has lots of hair. This happens to be a male carpenter bee. Um, you can see by the, uh, the spot on the head. Most male bees will have, if it's a male, has that sort of white uh, spot on the, on the head. Um, here's a bumblebees uh, in our yard, um, sweat bees in our yard. 
and uh, of course butterflies in the yard. So these are examples of some of the pollinators. <clears throat> uh, sweat bees, for example, who would think the sweat bees? Uh, these are uh, a list over at the side. This is all from the University of Georgia PDF that I mentioned, I'll give you the link to, uh, but it has all these really well done photographs of the bees that particularly in Georgia, but these are the same bees I see in my yard. So it's not unique to Georgia. <clears throat> Here's one, for example, on Black-Eyed Susan. This is a sweat bee. And um, the, notice that the, uh, it has uh, lots of hairs that gather pollen on the legs. Not a pollen basket as such, but uh, it also has a sort of a squared off uh, heads and a short antenna. So, and it's small. So these are sometimes you have to look in order to find them. Here's a few more. Um, one on Mexican sunflower on the left. So you can see it here. So again, it's, they're quite small, but notice it's loaded with pollen. And then here's another one loaded with pollen here, um, again, on, on the smooth aster uh, flower with the ray flowers and then the disc flowers in the middle. And these are all the anthers you see popped up here. So it's gathering a good source of pollen. So if you remember in all bees, um, bees require both pollen and nectar. And nectar basically is the fuel that keeps them going. And the protein is basically the food that they raise their young and larvae on. So the protein source is in the pollen and the carbohydrate, which is the fuel that allows them to, to fly, uh, uh, is um, in the, in the uh, nectar. Here's a little leafcutter bee. This is a common leafcutter bee in, uh, on, on Linda's oregano in the front yard. Um, and um, it, uh, I see quite a few of those in my yard. Uh, they have really uh, strong mandibles. You can see them here. Uh, good for chewing holes in leaves, taking circular uh, amounts of leaf material from certain specific host plants that they like to visit. So they'll cut right through it with those mandibles. Uh, they then carry it off and then stuff it in a hollow um, tube or hollow stem and uh, lay an egg with a little uh, pollen and nectar uh, uh, droplet or so uh, with an egg and the larvae will emerge the next year as, a, as an adult um, leaf cutter. Um, here's a whole book uh, which is more sort of scientifically oriented for the scientists on, on solitary bees because unlike honeybees which uh, live in colonies, and are, are truly social, uh, these solitary bees are solitary. They are, are not social, and do not live in large groups or populations. So, uh, and usually live in the ground. Um, the, um, there's an evening bee. This evening bee over here, which you see on the cover, uh, has it, <laughs> it's, its hind legs sticking up in the air, actually visited, had visited my yard. I've got pictures of one in my yard of the same, it's called an evening bee. Uh, and over here on the on this side, you can see uh, a little activity going on here uh, and uh, um, mating of, of the, the um, little, the bees there. So again, these are the little, uh, um, I can get rid of my, one of the mining bees, and they're very furry. You can see the hair on them. <clears throat> the um, apity family, uh, as the, the, the bee family, has the honey, digger, cuckoo, carpenter, bumble, and longhorn bees. You see those over here, again, from the Georgia publication. Um, here's one of the longhorn bees and, and one of Linda's um, uh, Mexican sunflowers, which is a very popular plant in our yard. We, we love it. It's not native, but Boy, is it a, an attraction for all kinds of bees. Um, <clears throat> bumblebees are the other one that you've, uh, we've seen. And there is one uh, publication, Bumblebees of North America. Uh, there's a free publication you could download. You'll have the, I'll give you the PDF link for this, but it just covers the Eastern United States. So well, little documented book, uh, full color uh, and describes the species of, of bumblebees. Nice resource if you're interested in, in bumblebees. 
here's a bumblebee on um, the um, blue cardinal plant. And can you see the hairs? I mean, it, these bees are full of hair. And one of the reasons they're so good at pollinating is a lot of times the pollen, if, when it's dry enough, uh, due to elect electrostatic uh, charges, will actually jump on the hairs and will be captured that way. So um, these bees, both, both honeybees and most other bees uh, are full of hair. Uh, and a lot of their branch hair. So they're very, almost like a feather, uh, uh, they are the hair. So they do attract a lot of pollen and carry it. <clears throat> um, here's the cuckoo or squash bees that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and again, uh, I've had cuckoo bees in my yard. Uh, squash bees, we do have squash and cucumber. And this particular bee is very picky. And if you want this bee in your yard, uh, you'll want to have some squash and cucumbers or melons in your yard. So they're specialists. They're not generalists. Um, so they pollinate only cucurbits in the squash family, pumpkins, zucchini, squash, gourds, and cucumbers. So, and they usually form their little burrows. They live in the ground, usually under or near the squash plant. And a lot of times the males hang out in the flower waiting for females to visit. Uh, to um, start a mating cycle within the flower. Um, and they fly, these bees are out much, much earlier than our honeybees. Our honeybees are sort of lackadaisical in the early mornings, but these bees are all out and active. So most of the pollinating on pumpkins and zucchinis are really brought about by this little bee. Uh, here's some pollinator reference books. Uh, again, I'll have uh, these links out there. For you, but um, this is an identification data and plant forage guide. Uh, Bees in Your Backyard is another great book um, that has been published uh, a couple years ago. Uh, Our Native Bees, lots of interesting stories in this book uh, on the North Americans and danger pollinators and the fight to save them. Uh, again, uh, the awareness of native bees has really come since all of the focus has been on honeybees. Uh, we're now beginning to focus on our truly native bees to North America. And a new book that'll be out published in July um, is by the same group that published or same couple that published the Bees in Your Backyard. This one's going to be Common Bees of Eastern North America. Um, and it'll be um, uh, uh, portable so you can carry it in the field with you. Uh, lots of photographic guides, a photographic guide to it. And mainly the bees that are east of the Mississippi River, which of course includes us. So uh, looking forward to probably putting this on my shelf. Uh, don't tell Linda. Uh, other pollinators that we have, we might kind of consider butterflies. Uh, again, this is from the Georgia publication, but identifying some of the common butterflies that you find. And most of these I have seen in, in my yard. Uh, here's one, a little pepper and salt skipper on again on the Mexican sunflower. Um, it's uh, uh, proboscis is right here going into the flower, getting the nectar. So it has a long proboscis as do most butterflies and moths. Mm. Flies, yes, flies are good pollinators and there are a whole host of flies. And we're not talking about the house fly here. We're talking about other types of flies that are present in our environment that most of us just overlook. Uh, remember flies are members of the, fa of the family diptera, uh, diptera meaning two wings. So if they have two wings, it's a fly. If they have four wings, it's a bee. Uh, so you can usually tell them apart if they're not flying and you can see the wings on up. Uh, hoverflies are another one that's our, there's a whole field guide out now uh, covering flower flies, a uh, huge thick publication. Uh, that has the key in it and to identify these hoverflies. Here's an example of the Peruvian daffodil in my yard. And you can see the hoverfly uh, very nicely going after pollen. So they are, they do uh, require pollen, again, as a protein source. So um, it uh, uh, will visit uh, the pollen and gather and, and take it back. So hoverflies are interesting. And they get their name from the fact that you've probably noticed that they kind of hover uh, in the air around them. Beetles and moths are another 
a good pollinator group. Um, there's a, again, this is from the, the uh, Georgia publication showing some of the most common ones that I have. Uh, I've seen all of these in my yard, so it's not specific to Georgia. And wasps, a lot of different wasps uh, that visit the yard. Uh, and again, I've seen all of these in my yard. So um, these are quite, quite prevalent in the Southeast. Uh, there's a whole new book that's just been brought out by Heather Holm uh, on wasps. Beautiful, uh, large format book, uh, all kinds of descriptions uh, identifying uh, the wasp and what they visit. Um, here's a, a threaded wasted wasp, one of them in our yard. Uh, with a little bit of activity going on. Again, on the oregano, it seems to be attractive uh, on the mating. Again, you can see the, the white dot right here on the front, the white face. Uh, that's the male, uh, and this is the female. Uh, and those are not the eyes there. They kind of, there's a highlight on the eye. <clears throat> uh, one of the things as a beekeeper that we do here in North Carolina, we sort of monitor the flowering plants. Uh, we're kind of interested basically in our hives and, and a lot of people want honey. Uh, so we sort of monitor the flowering plants that are occurring. Uh, and um, if you go out to the website, uh, northcarolinabeekeepers.org, under resources, you'll find uh, pollen plants listed here, flowering plants. And it'll come up with a list of all the plants and the dates that they flower uh, in um, the coastal area, the Piedmont and the mountains. They're divided up by, by the uh, eco regions in the state. Um, these you will not find on that list. These are sort of minor um, sources of nectar and pollen that uh, bees, if they're flying in January or February, will, will visit uh, on days when the temperature is above 45 or 50 degrees. Uh, they'll be out visiting. So uh, both the snowflake um, and um, the grape hyacinth and uh, crocus uh, are good forage plants for really early uh, visitors. Most of our native bees have not emerged yet, so they don't take advantage of this. Dead nettle is another one that's a great source early on. Um, most people hate this plant, but it does have quite beautiful flowers, a member of the, of the mint family. Uh, and uh, it uh, bees love it. It's an early plant that they can visit and they will gather and you will notice that they have um, red pollen. If you look right around here on the back of this leg. Uh, there's red pollen there. So this has red pollen. So as a beekeeper, we kind of monitor the front of our hive. And a lot of times we can tell by the color of pollen being brought in on, on the back legs, what plant they've been visiting. <clears throat> uh, hen bets, another one. Uh, People love to get rid of this, but it's again, a great pollinator uh, plant uh, for pollinators. Uh, here's a early uh, 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 Eastern a bumblebee visiting uh, the plant. These has these little landing pads on them so they can get right in and get access to the nectar. Hen bit, and then they don't last very long, but boy, they make sometimes lawns are beautiful uh, with this plant. <clears throat> Uh, the primary nectar and pollen plants are sort of shown in this diagram. Uh, starting down here at the base, uh, we have red maple, and it gives the time period from 1st of February, and it's uh, in flower for about 40 days. Uh, that varies, of course, depending on the, the time of the year, uh, but uh, that's the average. Uh, and then we have sugar maple, we have dandelion, has a long 60 days. Sumac is out. Uh, a lot of these will not cover. I just want to put it up here to show you that all the way up through September uh, uh, and um, late August, we have a little nectar flow here with aster and goldenrod um, that uh, bees can bring in and get ready for uh, winter. <clears throat> um, so pollinator supportive trees, our primary one here are red maple early in February and um, tulip poplar. And these, uh, again, trees are, are these are all na native trees to our area. The, the big leaf uh, maple is not native here. It's a, it's a West Coast thing, but red maple sort of stands out here as, as our primary source. And tulip poplar coming up here will be in flower in, in April, late April. 
Uh, we do celebrate National uh, Arbor Day coming up April the 30th this year. Uh, and I think there'll be something in Graham, maybe. Uh, they usually celebrate Arbor Day. Uh, yesterday's pollen report, uh, thought you might be interested, uh, very high. And uh, some of you are, know are sufferers, uh, but I get an email regularly for each day from the Raleigh uh, area, the report from Raleigh. It's yes, it's to the east of me and maybe we're about a week or two weeks behind uh, what's flowering over there. But you can see here again, trees, we have oak, pine, willow, birch, hickory, and pecan pollen that they have captured by filtration and identified. Uh, well, there's some grasses that are flowering and weeds, including what's one, the weed is dock that's currently flowering. So it's pretty high count. And um, uh, I like to monitor this, particularly a beekeeper in early spring, you can begin to watch this report and begin to see the first appearance of red maple pollen. Uh, which is an indication that those trees are open and we can sort of gauge about a week or so they'll be uh, available here uh, for forage in uh, Alamance County. So it's interesting to kind of watch to see what's, uh, what's out there and what's fine. Again, these are all wind pollinated. Um, even bees will visit wind pollinated plants, you know, again, to get protein and nectar. So flowering bees, uh, flowering begins in February here, question mark sometimes. Uh, again, red maple, sugar maple, and dandelion are the primary ones. Also on the chart, the days are presented here, but notice the color chart. These are the colors of pollen. So they actually provide uh, a chart for pollen. So as beekeepers, we can sort of monitor again, uh, based on the color chart, uh, what sort of pollen's uh, coming in and what plants they're visiting. Uh, I'll put this link out. This is a very interesting um, um, YouTube video uh, by Mike Connor, an, an arborist, uh, on trees, bees and trees. That's really well done uh, and uh, was presented back in 2015. But bees and trees is a great presentation uh, if you're interested in, in the importance of trees to our bees. Here's the female red maple. Um, and uh, it's, uh, again, Really, um, uh, we monitor this for early bee activity when, again, the, the temperature is above uh, 45 or 50, the bees are out flying and gathering. There are the stigmas, so they're quite small sticking out here. And again, they kind of hang out in the wind. Again, it's a, a wind pollinated plant. So the stigmas are sticky and out in the wind. And you see that they're red in color. So uh, once pollination occurs, uh, you begin to get the developing winged fruit that we normally see on maples. So uh, the, uh, you'll see that here uh, quite readily and they get mature and uh, will eventually fall. Here's the red maple male. So this plant comes in both male and female plants. Uh, they're called dioecious, meaning there are two houses. There's basically a tree that that basically kind of houses the female flower, another one that houses the, the male flowers. And here you can see the uh, anthers are quite prevalent here um, out and again, exposed to wind that would carry it off and also exposed to bees. Bees collect pollen and nectar from this plant. And here's some in full flower with the uh, anthers ripe and full and uh, ready for forage. <clears throat> And it's a native, again, it's a native plant. Distribution is well spread across North Carolina and has beautiful fall color. So it's an interesting plant. A lot of the taxonomists now uh, and um, a lot of the sites like Name That Plant have access to these really well-documented um, distribution maps. So this is the distribution map for Acer rubrum, the red maple. Uh, and it confirms the uh, sightings where records are recorded uh, a lot of these records are maintained in herbaria, uh, like UNC and NC State, uh, where they uh, press the plants and have it on record, uh, and it's been identified by a specialist. So uh, again, these becoming more and more elaborate in terms of, of what information they have. The last one we have here is dandelion. Um, again, a great pollinator plant for early in the year. Um, here's a nice shot over in Ypsilo, Sweden. Uh, obviously, they don't they don't use uh, 
herbicides there for the dandelion. Again, a long 60 days that's available. Uh, I've seen it, of course, in flower in December, here and there, patchy. So um, again, these are estimates of when they're basically in full flower. And I have a lot of them in flower right now. Uh, they're composed basically of all ray flowers. There's no disc flowers, uh, even though it's a member of the Asteraceae, which has both ray and disc flowers. The dandelion is basically composed of, of the florets uh, um, in, uh, in the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the ray florets, ray flowers. It's a major nectar and pollen source early in the year. Uh, a lot of times the honey is sort of um, uh, a yellow, deep yellow. Uh, and it does granulate. So a lot of members of the Asteraceae, if the bees are bringing in nectar, that nectar will granulate, meaning it, it'll uh, turn uh, sugar uh, crystals will occur more readily. Just here's some, just some photos of dandelions, which you might see. Here's the color, the color of pollen, soft orange in color. Uh, and as, as the, all the Asteraceae, all members of the Aster family, are of uh, reproduction by Pappus, the little seeds are 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 attached to these uh, the pappus these little uh, these hairs uh, take off in the wind so it's all asteraceae this distribute basically their seeds uh, through this method <clears throat> another uh, critical plant here is the red bud uh, eastern red bud the heart shaped leaves it has white pollen uh, again you can see that when it comes into the hive very easily and it's a good source early in the year, particularly as brood rearing in our native or our um, managed beehives uh, begins to occur. The queen begins to lay in, in, in mid-January uh, and brood is there. It requires a good source of, of nectar and it also requires pollen as the protein source. And again, flowers will appear in clusters along the stem. Uh, notice they look, they're a member of the pea family, legumes, so the pea-like flowers, uh, and again, it has a broad distribution. Uh, you can see the, the, our mixed forest here all the way through. It comes down through here. So good representation of um, specimens here. Flowering in April, we have a number of them. We're not going to cover these. I'll mention uh, Alsic uh, clover, uh, uh, basically, and tulip poplar uh, will be mentioned. and. Uh, We'll look at those briefly. Here's the clover. And again, a lot of people, if you keep your blade on your mower above four inches, um, you should initiate fresh new blooms coming up. Uh, pollen color is a yellow brown. Again, it's widely distributed, not a native, uh, but it certainly adapted well to our lawns and fixes nitrogen. So it's a good, uh, good plant to have in your, in your yard. Tulip poplar is our main primary nectar source for our honeybee and for our beekeepers here in Alamance County. Uh, April the 25th, May 24th is the proximate period of time that's in flower, about 29 days. Um, has a cream color uh, pollen. Um, it's a monofloral honey. So when this becomes available and the beekeepers have their honey supers on, the primary nectar coming in during that period of time um, can come in as become dark amber in color, almost black, and uh, or has a, a purish reddish color to it. But that is uh, the source of, of nectar primarily here in the Piedmont and is our basically primary flow. So it's a good host plant also, um, tulip poplar, for the tiger swallowtail butterfly. So here's a, a leaf from um, uh, tulip poplar, and you can see the eggs here. Here's a little larvae that's hatched. Uh, here's some older larvae. Here's an older one even. Uh, it has an ostrium that protrudes if threatened by, by um, a predator of some sort. Uh, gives off a foul odor. Uh, so they do have some defenses built in, but um, the eastern swallowtail will have three brood cycles here in North Carolina. Um, the chrysalis will overwinter, and you can see one over here. Uh, with a little silk thread that's kind of holding that, and it merges basically well camouflaged within the bark of this particular stem or tree. Um, so Eastern Swallowtail uh, eventually emerges and I've already seen them in the yard this year so far. So uh, they are out 
uh, again, uh, uh, love to see them in the yard. <clears throat> Following in May and June, I'm only going to talk about one plant here, and that is uh, the sarwood. Uh, many of you probably have sampled sarwood honey, um, and it does have a really light color pollen. Um, but it's, uh, again, it's uh, light gray in color. Only 20 days it's flowering. This is primarily in the mountains. We do have them scattered here in the Piedmont. Uh, but the primary grouping is more towards the uh, foothills and the mountains of North Carolina. So a lot of beekeepers take their hives up there to capture the nectar as it comes off between the, the early June uh, and late June, and then bring them back, bring their, their, their hives back. Sarwood uh, has urn-shaped flowers that hang upside down. And as they mature, and once pollination occurs, they begin to turn up. You can see it beginning to turn here, upright, 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 upright. Kind of unusual behavior if you haven't noticed it, uh, but they hang down. So rain hitting it doesn't affect the nectar inside the urn-shaped flower, which is true of, um, of our persimmon, uh, same way that it occurs, same for our blueberries. Uh, again, these urn-shaped flowers, uh, have the, they don't perform this sort of uh, dance upright, but uh, they, uh, they do have the urn-shaped flower. Uh, you know, I cut one, cut them in half here, a couple of them, and you can see the pistil usually sticks right out at the tip. Here are the anthers inside. This is the ovary where the eggs or seed would develop. Uh, same way here, again, the anthers, uh, and um, there's the, the pistil, uh, the female part of the, of the flower. Uh, again, the nectaries are at the base here. Uh, sourwood will, again, uh, have uh, fruit capsules that form and um, also provide a really beautiful color during the fall. <clears throat> again, well distributed uh, across North Carolina. We do have it here, but again, it's, uh, larger populations are located in the foothills or mountains. So it's about an hour in. Let's take a five-minute break or intermission, and I'll come back, and we're going to just see some of my pollinator picks, uh, plants that I have in the yard that have been successful and I think are a great source of, uh, of, of pollen and nectar for our native bees as well as our honeybees. <clears throat> If anyone has any questions, they are welcome to, to put them in the chat box and uh, we will address them a little bit later at, toward the end of the program or, um, or it's possible, there's a possibility, it may not be a strong possibility that I could actually answer the questions in the chat. So um, ask away.
Uh, yes, a recording will be available of this webinar later, uh, probably without the five minute intermission, <laughs> but it'll be available on YouTube. Um, in the, I, I would say by, by the early next week. For some reason, you're muted, Jeff. Uh, there we go. Can yeah, the Mason, the Mason B question there. Um, it's um, takes patience. A lot of times, you'll set these little places up, and it'll be a few years before they're discovered. But uh, once they are, um, they're okay. And a lot of the houses you might want to search on the web. Um, uh, there are some problems with some of the way they're made and constructed that are not conducive to uh, the bees uh, finding a home there. So you want to be careful the type of, of home or house that you, you gather. Uh, Debbie Ruse has a lot of information on mason bees and the internet's loaded with all kinds of information on mason bees. And particularly if you do a search, use the extension .edu uh, that'll get you to some of the um, extension and some of the university that will have some really relevant information on, on Mason bees. Um, but there is a lot of information out there available. And there's a question about Mahonia. Uh, oh yeah. Mahonia. Uh, yeah. It's a good source of nectar. Um, it's um, the, uh, um, it's spread by birds. It's an exotic. It's not native here. Uh, but during the winter, I've had them flowering in mid-January. And when the bees are flying, it's a good nectar and pollen source. Uh, it can be invasive, so you've got to be careful. Uh, some woods are spread with it. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a native. Right. Okay. Thanks. And it's, it's also a little bit prickly if you've been around them. <laughs> to try to prune. <laughs> so you kind of have a good yeah. pair of gloves on to protect you. But uh, it, it is an interesting plant and uh, evergreen, which is another nice thing. So <clears throat> there are some cultivars that actually bloom in late fall and have soft leaves. So that's true. Yes, you're <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So those are those are well, they don't do the same. They don't provide the flowers in January, but uh, they have softer leaves. So there's that. <laughs> And you can work without gloves, maybe. <laughs> yes. Long sleeves made out of leather. <clears throat> okay. Are we ready to start up, I think? Oh, yeah. Okay. Go. That's a pretty good question. Marba Taylor asks if loropetalum is a cousin of witch hazel. And she had, the, the question is, is it good for pollinators? Laura Petalum is a cousin of witch hazel, but not. Um, as far as I know, it's not a very good pollinator plant or nectar plant. <laughs> so You know, I've uh, never seen insects visit it. I haven't either. I've got it in my yard, in the front yard, in the side, and I've never, I've watched it. I've photographed it, but I've not seen any pollinators visit. So uh, hmm. it, it's a nice cover plant. I mean, a nice shrub, nice color. Uh, a nice flower in this time of year, but I don't think it's a great pollinator plant at all. Um, so now we'll get some uh, pictures here on the uh, pollinator picks that I've picked uh, that I found to be most successful here in, in the yard. And one of them is the service berry, which is flowers very early. Mine is already flowered and finished. And um, it's um, uh, an attractive uh, shrub, um, not very tall. Uh, and it's been around, it's a, a native plant, sometimes called service berry or, or June berry. It does have berries. People do have made uh, jams and so forth with the, the little fruits that eventually form. Unfortunately, it is a, a 
can be occupied by apple cedar rust. Yeah. So the fruit will will have the apple cedar rust on it. So it's not good in that standpoint. But um, if it's free of that, it's it, it's a good plant to have. Early flower. Here's a little mason bee uh, right there. So mason bees are around in the area, and uh, a little patience uh, is required, I think, in order to get them attracted to to a, um, a home of such, they find it. Another one is Eastern Nybark. Uh, this is one that grows uh, in the, in the um, our rain garden. It's also as part of the buffer program. This is a cultivar uh, with the darker leaves, um, but it's a plant that um, they provided for putting along stream banks. So it does grow very well in sort of a wet, damp environment. Uh, and, and is a, a member of our, our rain garden. Uh, but you can take the stems in the, in the winter, cut them, making sure that you keep the apical end up uh, and drive the stake into the ground and it will root uh, by springtime. Uh, very interesting plant. Um, this is one of the center glow. This is a hybrid. Uh, I've, I've switched now to the native one, which is not, has these not, not have the colored leaves on it. Uh, Spirea-like flower clusters appear. Uh, quite spectacular, and um, it gets its name basically nine bark from the fact that there are layers of bark, and it's been counted like nine layers of bark sometimes peel off. So it's how it's got its name, nine bark. Uh, it does have fruit, uh, and um, it is gathered by 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 birds and, and mammals. Uh, this was taken yesterday in my yard, uh, yeah. and uh, we have this red buckeye in the in our rain garden that was just a stick. And Linda was really upset, my wife, when we bought a, a $25 stick in a pot <laughs> and planted it. So 10 years later, it finally has proved its worth uh, and she's thrilled by it. Uh, and you can see over here the flower stock. Uh, you can see these white structures right here. Uh, those are the stigmas sticking out. You can see the anthers sticking out here also and notice how they're all kind of raised up so whatever pollinator comes in uh, these anthers rub uh, the base of the animal or that's coming in uh, and uh, coats it with pollen and when it lands on another flower it transfers that pollen to the stigma so and they do produce, produce uh, fruit so as you might surmise uh, this plant is visited by our friend the hummingbird uh, and uh, bees also forage on it, um, and red pollen from the flowers in early spring. So uh, it's spectacular now. And I think the one at the Arbor Gate, is it flowering now, Chris? Yes, it's yeah. in full bloom and it's beautiful. Oh, yes, yeah. And another red one that I like is the coral honeysuckle and vines. Oh, yeah. And um, this, uh, again, is another great plant long tubular flowers and our, the hummingbirds here uh, love this plant. Um, beautiful flowers, uh, stigmas uh, stick well out ahead. Here's the stigma and then the anthers are right here. So uh, butterfly or bee that tries to land here. Most bees don't visit because their tongues aren't long enough, but you will find them putting a slit at the base where the nectaries are located and actually rob it of nectar. They'll stick their proboscis right there where they made the slit. So carpenter bees and bumblebees are capable of doing this. Honeybees, unfortunately, mandibles aren't strong enough, uh, but they do know to go to that area. Uh, my blueberries have scars left by the bumblebees and the, and the, the honeybees will find uh, that scar and ins insert their proboscis to gather nectar. Uh, it's called nectar robbing. Uh, but a great, great plant. It's a, a larval food plant in the spring for the Azor butterflies. Uh, again, it's visited by bees, butterflies, fruits eaten by, be, uh, by, the, by the birds. Another one is cross vine. It's another native. Uh, and uh, again, a good for a, a fence row. Um, beautiful flowers. Mine's got buds on it right now. And um, it's a woody, woody vine um, eaten by mammals, nectar, a food source, hummingbirds visit bumblebees, honeybees. Uh, over here, you can see uh, the uh, rear end, the abdomen of a, mm. of, a, uh, of, a, of a bumblebee that's 
crawled inside. And when you look closely at the flower, when it crawls inside, you notice the anthers and the, and the stigma are right out here in front. So as it butts its way into the back to get to the nectar, as it gets its back coated with pollen and then can be transferred to, to other flowers. Again, a, a great adaptation of the co-evolution of these bees and flowers. Spiderwort is another one that's a long, long bloomer um, of interest in the garden. It's easily grown. Uh, it also benefits uh, native bees, bumblebees, honeybees. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a great, great plant to have. It's e easy to grow, it spreads. You can plant clumps, uh, clumps of it. Flowers are quite spectacular. They open daily, new ones will open. Uh, beautiful arrangement of these uh, hairs a very large hairs. You almost see the cells that build these these hairs at the base of the of the anthers, and then the sort of interesting coloration of the anther itself. Uh, but the filament of the anther is coated with these with these long hairs. Another one is black eyed Susan, great plant, a member of the Asteraceae. Again, it's characterized by the by the uh, disc and ray flowers. Blooms June to September. Uh, usually full sun, tracks a lot of, of, of bees in our yard. Uh, and here you can see a, uh, a black-eyed Susan uh, with a honeybee. Uh, here's the disc flowers and here are the ray flowers around the outside. Mm. Another great bee plant that I love is Anis Hesop, uh, a member of the mint family. Uh, it's native. Uh, June till September, it's full flush. You can cut it back. It'll re regenerate uh, floral shoots. A full sun apart attracts all kinds of, of pollinators uh, and for a long period of time. It, um, it is also noticed that there is a, a cuckoo leafcutter bee that's uh, already feeding on it. So there's a cuckoo bee in, my, in the yard. And you can see the flowers have these long stigmas that stick way out. Here's the stigmatic surface here. Uh, there's another view, a little close up and inside door picture of it. Uh, and here's one outside with a bumblebee visiting. But look at all the, all of the <laughs> um, stigma, stigmatic surfaces sticking out here, uh, ready to rub against uh, a pollinator coming up. Another great plant is mountain mint. And um, it's again, herbaceous. It's a member of the mint family. Uh, bloom time, July to September. Uh, great attractant uh, for pollinators. Uh, in fact, I've got my bee, adjacent to my beehives, I have a patch of it. Uh, mountain mint, again, it's, as, it's, as it's usually uh, referred to, uh, the bees love it. It has uh, flowers that open daily around the margin and keep opening um, as it matures, uh, continue to open from the center. <clears throat> Oak leaf hydrangea is another great, great plant, uh, foliage plant. Uh, up, up, attracts a lot of pollinators, primarily because of the, the white flowers. Again, it attracted the bees. The white ones you see that are so obvious are really sterile. There's no reproductive structures on these sterile cell, these sterile uh, flowers. The real pollen and, and, and pistils, uh, female parts are in this part here. So, but that's not very attractive, but it has somehow been able, it has produced these larger white flowers, which is the attractant for the nectar and pollen. Uh, another one is the sweet pepper bush, uh, which is a part of the rain garden. Uh, and um, it has uh, these beautiful spikes of flowers. Uh, some of them are white. Some of the other ones are, uh, you can get them are sort of a pink color. Um, but these are very fragrant white flowers, very, very sweet fragrance. Uh, when you pass by. Here's just a few examples of some of the pollinators on it. This is the variety Ruby Spice uh, and um, honeybees, bumblebees, and even the, um, the great purple hair strick uh, butterfly has visited uh, and uh, wasps, all kinds of wasps visit this. So it's a great plant to, to have. Uh, dotted horse mint, another great one. Um, and uh, it's bloom time, June, June to July, as sort of short, but does attract a lot of native bees. Uh, it's a perennial, comes back, a member of the mint family. 
So it's a great plant to have. Uh, the blue cardinal flower is another favorite. It grows well in our near a rain garden. Uh, and uh, it's uh, July to September. Uh, again, I've seen hummingbirds, butterflies, all kinds of pollinators on this plant. Uh, and I don't want to uh, uh, take favor away from this one. Uh, this is another species of the cardinal plant. This is the red cardinal plant, uh, but it is also quite spectacular. Uh, and you can see that here's the um, stigmatic surfaces sitting right up here. So any pollinator that comes in uh, uh, will rub its back on this uh, stigmatic surface that's sticking out on the little landing pad that's provided here. <clears throat> Here's another, the blue cardinal flower again uh, with a butterfly and a, a, here's a bumblebee gathering lots of pollen on his uh, back leg. Another great plant is verbena, has a long sort of flowering period. Um, the verbena uh, also is attractant to a lot of our moths that fly during the day. Um, this, this is the, the sort of the hummingbird uh, moth that uh, a lot of people will see in their yard. It's one of the few uh, moths that fly during the day. Um, the sphinx moth does fly during the day also, but this one, they have a long proboscis uh, that they can dip into tubular flowers. Lantanas, uh, if you have lantana in the yard, you often find these um, moths uh, hovering there. Uh, velvet, the hibiscus is a, another great plant. Um, coming in various colors, but a good pollen source and the stigmatic surfaces right out in front and then the pollen along the side. So great plant. Gay feather, again, a member of the Asteraceae. It has a interesting uh, way it flowers uh, mature. It actually opens at the tip. Uh, these are the oldest flowers and these are the youngest flowers. And these are the flower buds that have yet to open. So it's an interesting downward trend that you normally don't see in, in spikes of flowers. You usually have the mature flowers here and then the younger ones at the tip. But this, uh, again, interesting um, um, evolutionary trend in that particular plant, the gay feather. Uh, Joe pie weed, uh, again, <laughs> weed in the ditches in North Carolina is another great source for pollinators. It's again, uh, um, uh, a member of the Asteraceae family and um, uh, well-suited for our pollinators. Climbing aster, another great uh, plant to have. I've had flowers and bees visiting these flowers in mid-December mm -hmm. when the weather's been right. Even after a frost, the, their new blooms will open. So it's a great pollinator plant. Uh, again, a member of the aster family. It's a native, um, uh, really nice ray flowers and then the disc flowers in the middle. Uh, groundsel uh, is another tree, sometimes called sea myrtle. It's spread from the coastal area, and basically you'll find along the freeways, particularly during the winter, as you're driving, you'll see huge patches that have these white tips on them. Looks like they might have frost on them, uh, but it's, a, again, a member of the, of the Asteraceae. Uh, the male plants, it has male and female plants, but the male flowers provide lots of nectar. Uh, bees are all over this when it's in flower in, in later, later in the summer. Uh, and uh, here are the female flowers. Again, the pappus uh, have these uh, long pappus hairs on them. Uh, each one uh, will have a, a, uh, a seed attached. There are the seeds. And again, these are carried off in the wind. Uh, it's referred to as an akeen. And then the pappus attached. So these are, again, windblown uh, and carried in the wind. That's why I think they spread so well along the freeway as the cars go by. I think there's a, a drift as people drive from the coast, um, wind driving these uh, particular uh, seeds uh, up the up 40 and 85. So um, here are some of the, the leaf area. It um, sort of resembles lamb's quarters when it's coming up in your yard. So a lot of people just pull it as a, as a weed, but this plant is spreading rapidly. Um, white wood uh, aster is another great one. Uh, it's uh, common in our rain garden, but uh, falls uh, flowers late in the fall. Uh, not real spectacular, but a very nice attractive for late in the fall and primarily a great shade plant uh, and spreads uh, 
quickly. Um, and uh, again, provides bumblebees and honeybees uh, mm-hmm. nectar. One of the favorites uh, native, again, is the frost aster, uh, which again uh, is relevant in, to our bees and part, becomes part of the fall nectar flow for our honeybee colonies. And it, it also grows in the ditches and you'll see it in the fields uh, and uh, a great, great, great plant for pollinators. It has a reddish yellow pollen, so you can see when it's coming in. Uh, it's a major source in the fall, uh, bees bringing this into the hive uh, as they prepare the hives uh, for winter. Again, the 35 days of flowering time. <laughs> uh, rough leaf goldenrod is another one you'll find scattered in the fields. And here it's mixed with, with the frost aster over here. Um, uh, again, loaded with flowers, a member of the Asteraceae family. It's a great, great plant. Uh, here's a um, fireworks, a rough leaved um, goldenrod. Again, good butterfly food for 18 species. Um, it uh, yeah, nectar and pollen source for our bees. Uh, and uh, again, really uh, attracted. Um, small little flowers, but lots of, of uh, available forage for bees. And allergy suffers? Well, not really. You will not find uh, in the uh, Raleigh re- pollen report in the fall any mention of, of goldenrod pollen. That's because primarily some people confuse this with ragweed, which is the culprit that most of us are allergic to or have an allergy to. Goldenrod, as with most of the bee pollinated plants, have very heavy, sticky pollen and are not really adapted for wind transport. So again, uh, you can plant all the goldenrod you can, and we have many, many species of goldenrod uh, that fall uh, far in the fall and are available. Coneflower is another great plant. Um, it's the nectar source. Um, and uh, has, uh, again, these ray flowers and disc flowers in the middle, different colors. Um, again, stay away from any sort of double you might have, but they are a beautiful plant to have and flower a long time. Uh, here's a link I'll put in for everybody in that resource list, a research report, a research report that came out on the Echinacea uh, for the mid-Atlantic region. And it's filled with all kinds of information on some of the hybrids and a lot of the, the, the native um, uh, echinacea plants that you have. So uh, again, it's a, a great publication. It's free, full color, uh, beautiful publication. Uh, catnip uh, is another one. This one's just taken in our Arbor Gate garden. Uh, again, a member of the mint family. Uh, really profuse in terms of flower and foliage uh, and for forage. That's a good nectar source. Uh, again, has this little landing pad that comes in uh, for the native bees or bumblebees, whatever, they grab onto that. Um, and of course, as usual, the reproductive parts of the flower are right here at the top where they would uh, butt their head in. Uh, catnip versus cat mint. Uh, there's some confusion about this. They are different species, uh, different color. Catnip is usually has white flowers. Uh, I had a bunch of catnip in my yard. Bees loved it. Uh, and uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a good a, a plant that spreads. It uh, is the one that has the nepta lactone uh, in the catnip that makes our cats ecstatic. So uh, that's not, this particular compound is not found in the catnip. Um, so um, the true cat nip uh, has the, has the uh, uh, compound that, that our cats love. <clears throat> Another common smart weed in the fall, uh, common weed is called the smart weed. A lot of people will pull this up, it's common weed, but it is a great, great plant for our pollinators. 126 days, it's usually in flowering. So uh, very, very great uh, plant. Um, and it has, again, a, a good nectar and pollen source in the fall. Uh, has a particular light grayish yellow color. And again, it's well spread across the eastern part of the United States. Another great plant. Then we have crepe myrtle, uh, uh, which is um, uh, a great plant as far as its um, flower color and uh, when it flowers. Um, belongs to the loose strife family. 
uh, blooms July to September, as most of you know. It is a great pollen source, but unfortunately, it doesn't have any nectaries. So uh, it's only a pollen source uh, for our bees. Uh, as an unusual type, if you ever look at the flower very closely, you'll notice that there are two types of anthers. Some of them are brown. Uh, the brown anthers uh, are, pollen, are viable. So the, the pollen that carries the sperm that will cause, allow uh, pollination to complete uh, or fertilization are in these outer uh, brown anthers. These in the middle where bees and pollinators gather uh, pollen are non-viable. So they carry no reproductive potential uh, for crepe myrtle. Um, and you see the uh, scatter of petals around the outside. So again, you can see the pistils here, they're kind of curved. Uh, here are the brown anthers, again, well outside the location of the color uh, anthers inside. Uh, we do have National Pollinator Week coming up, um, uh, June 21st to the 27th. Um, I've got these azaleas in the front yard are just in full flower right now, um, but, and we have bumblebees. Honeybees usually don't visit these plants, so they're not uh, um, attracted to, to, our, to our honeybees. Uh, the pollinator and agriculture uh, poster that's being released this year by the uh, Pollinator Partnership, beautiful large poster, uh, which will be available soon. Uh, not a lot of information about the uh, artist, uh, but it does depict the importance of a number of the pollinators that we've talked about. Uh, in terms of agriculture and farmland. So very, very nice poster for this year. <clears throat> uh, so this is the end. Um, I will mention another plant that I love. It's an annual, is starflower and uh, borge. And it's uh, not a native, but boy, does it bring in the pollinators. And one of my photos happened to be on the North Carolina Bee Buzz, our local State Magazine uh, was selected for the, the winter, uh, winter issue uh, of, the, of the publication. So um, great, this plant uh, has flowers that hang upside down. So here's my email address. Uh, I'll leave that up there for a little bit. Um, again, if you would like a resource list, it'll take me a couple of days to pull it all together, uh, but I will give you all those links so that you can have access if you have an interest. Just send me a, an email, I'll be glad to give that to you. So, so it's Jeff Weister at mech.com. So there was a question um, in the chat. The question was, can you talk a little bit about what pollinator plants would be good for containers and raised beds? So, um, Great, great. Plant. If you're into herbs, any of That's the a, herbs. I would say the Mediterranean herbs are great in containers. They are. Absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, my wife, Linda, we, we have them out front in pots. Uh, and uh, whenever they flower, we try to leave the flowers there. Uh, basil, um, all the herbs, thyme, uh, all of those herbs are really great for uh, lavender. Lavender. And I will put, I will also make a note. Rosemary. I will post <laughs> rosemary. Yep. I will, I have a list of, of 12 herbs, uh, PDF sheets that are posted. Uh, I'll give you a link to it. It's posted on our Alamance County Beekeeper site uh, that you can print off uh, as color photos of the herbs and the pollinators, a lot of information about it. But I've got 12 herbs there. And I'll put that link in there. And I'll make a note right now to remind myself to put it there since there's a question about that. Um, yeah, a, a lot of plants are conducive. If you look at some of those publications, they do have plantings for containers uh, and uh, some of the recommended plants that might do well in containers. Dill is great, yep, swallowtails. Um, and, and lots of, of wasps uh, visit our dill, so. Okay, I'm gonna uh, stop our share. Everybody got my email address and I'll stop the share. If I can remember how to stop it. There was a question that's at the, um, 
I was under the impression that darker varieties of nine bark and other trees or shrubs were not as good. And I think they may be referring to when you spoke about to um, to the pigments, yes, the pigments in the leaves, not yeah, being great for forage. That's correct. Yeah, uh, that that's correct. I I uh, that's why I switched from the leaf once I found that out. I have the native um, nine bark that yeah. does not have that pigmentation. So, but it's uh, not as pretty. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kicker isn't it <laughs> well, we do like variety and diversity but you got to think like a bee and you think like a, a pollinator or a host plant um, yeah, we've got green leaves on other plants so <laughs> we do <laughs> that's true <laughs> well thank you so much jeff it was great as usual and we've all learned a lot so um, oh, thank you any other any other questions or I don't see any in the chat, but uh, okay. anybody wants to unmute well, themselves me, and ask. Give, yeah, give me a few. Seconds. Give me give me a few days, and I'll pull together the resource list. And if you email my email address, Jeff Leister at mac dot com, uh, I'll send uh, I'll send that to you. And the links will be active, so you don't have to type in those links, uh, which can be uh, cumbersome at times. Great. Well, thanks again. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. you're welcome. Yeah. Have a good day, everybody. Yeah. Okay, you too.